Now we have Bill Northey, Undersecretary for Food Production and Conservation at the Department of Agriculture in Washington. You know him, of course, as the three-time Secretary of Agriculture for the state of Iowa, and a lot of people know him as a corn and beans farmer from Dickinson County. Thank you, Bill, for joining us here today. Great to have you back in Iowa, and thanks for coming to your 12th, 13th Land Investment Expo. You saw year one in 2008. Tell us what you've seen as far as the growth of the expo itself. Well, just what a, what a tremendous event for Iowa to be able to have. I think it's a great place for it to be, uh, but to see what Steve and team has done in collecting uh, phenomenal speakers over the years from from the president to, to all kinds of folks, both in and outside of agriculture, um, and then the kinds of folks that it brings in. Because of the type of event it is, we got folks flying in from at least all over the country and maybe farther than that, uh, into Iowa in not the best time of year uh, for them to, well, they've gotta be inside, I guess, when they come to Iowa in January. Um, but uh, it's a wonderful event and great to be a part of. That speaks to an important point. Iowa as a focal point for American agriculture, and you have unique exposure to that as a fourth generation farmer. Tell us a little bit about your family coming to Iowa. Tell us about your farm operation. Give us some of your personal key background. Well, my family on my mom's side first came to Iowa back in the 1860s. Um, I've got an uncle that's on a farm that has been in the same in the family. Uh, that long, so over 150 years now. Um, my grandfather on my dad's side came, uh, bought his farm in the 1930s, so it's a lot newer uh, to us. Um, and that's the home farm that, that uh, we raised our girls on and, and we went over to grandpa and grandma's for Christmas and other kinds of things. So um, I, I do think that's a characteristic of many places in the world, certainly Iowa, not every farm has been in the family that long and we have first generation farmers too. We're very, very proud of those and glad to have them and certainly glad to have them in Iowa and any, any new farmers anyway. Um, but there's a legacy in that. There's a, there's a pride in that. There's a, a sense of are you pleasing those generations that were before and the kinds of things you're doing and you're doing things very different than what they were doing. You know, think of a farm in the 1860s. It was farmed with horses until maybe the 1930s. Um, so certainly, in many cases, maybe farmed as long with horses as been farmed with tractors of any size, let alone the kind of tractors that we see out there today run by GPS and all the other technologies. So um, as well as I think by its nature, you think there's generations after this too, right? We're not the last one, so, so are we doing right by them, whether they're our family or not? And I think that's a characteristic of uh, most producers around the country, certainly producers here in Iowa. I want to follow up that thought. Your, your mission as undersecretary is in food production and conservation. And that sounds very broad and uh, covers a large swath. But what you just described on your family farm were exactly those two points, production and conservation. Are you doing right by the land, by generations before you, generations to come. Um, you were president of the National Corn Growers in 95. Um, what have you seen, what were you implementing as far as cover crops and other sustainability issues, and how has that changed going forward? So in, in the 90s, I converted to ridge till and then no-till on my farm. I really didn't try cover crops until became Secretary of Agriculture, saw it on other people's farms, kind of fell in love with the idea and tried to figure out how it would work um, and, and wanted to do what I was telling other folks made sense to do. Um, and so that would have been, um, you know, later in the 2000s, maybe 2010 or something like that, uh, that I first started raising cover crops. But I'd gone to no-till by the early 2000s. Um, and, and I think, for me, these kinds of off-farm opportunities have been a chance to be able to talk with other folks, what they're, what they're doing around the country, my fellow corn grower leaders, um, what they're doing in other parts of Iowa when I was Secretary of Agriculture here, and I occasionally get 
out of the state as well to see farms in other places and talk to folks. And, or when you were with the Dickinson County Farm Bureau. Or the County Farm Bureau with leaders there or the Soil and Water Conservation District um, in Dickinson County. And, and you also got a sense as well that what you were doing on the farm had an impact off the farm. Um, uh, a part of an activity called the Hypoxia Task Force, which was looking at water quality in the Midwest and how it impacted the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and uh, to be able to understand the nutrient impact on, you know, a 600 acre farm in Northwest Iowa could have an impact, probably a small impact, but have an impact. Um, in the Delta. Thousand of miles away, yes. Um, and so that was really valuable to me as well. Not, you still, at the end of the day, you gotta make a living. You don't make a living, you don't get a farm next year. Uh, you don't put your kids through college. Um, and so you've got to be able to do all that. But it's but there are a lot of other things you need to do on a farm uh, in addition to making a living. That is that dynamic tension we were talking about between production and conservation. Overproduce, under sustainable. If you're too conservation oriented, like you say, the kids don't go to college, okay? So you've got to balance that both. Um, what was your transition from, um, from Dickinson County to Secretary of Agriculture? When did you, when did you make that? And, and then you had three terms there. Yeah, so I, I, I got involved in corn growers, um, Iowa National Corn Growers, served as president back in the mid-90s and got done with that experience and came back and, and really was farming full time all through that time, but farming at home, um, kind of figuring out if there was something else I wanted to do. Actually went on weekends, missed a lot of Iowa State football games. On weekends, got an MBA um, for two and a half years, and and that was a good experience and kind of broadened my thinking a little bit. And, and then the opportunity to be able to run for office as Secretary of Agriculture came along. Um, and there were folks that uh, said that's, you know, really administrative position, doesn't have a lot of opportunity to lead in different Do you things. want to be a pencil pusher for the next yeah, four years? Yeah, that's right. Do you want to just regulate folks and, and that's all it is? And, and, um, and yet, to me, a Secretary of Ag, um, and I think to everybody realizes too, if you think about it longer, has the opportunity, especially in Iowa, to be able to do some things and, and communicate some things that Iowa farmers feel uh, to be able to create some initiatives. We create a real initiative around nutrient reduction in Iowa as well. So looking at phosphorus and nitrogen reduction and how it impacted, it was part of that hypoxia effort, a, a statewide effort to look at improving our own water quality within Iowa, engaging farmers in that process too. Um, and, and that was an opportunity that obviously I wouldn't have had any opportunity to do without running for Secretary of Agriculture and being elected. So I was elected in 2006, um, extremely tight election, great support from the ag community here. Um, just I'll forever be grateful uh, for the support I got for that and then was reelected in 2010 and 2014. Um, I tell you, I would argue that being a state secretary or director or commissioner of agriculture is one of the best jobs in the world. So you get to spend time traveling around your state, talking to farmers and those in the ag community. You learn so much about what's going on in your state, someplace you thought you knew, but you didn't really know until you got around and you had reasons. And Iowa has 99 counties. I would visit all 99 counties every year. Um, and uh, I would get places, again, if you don't count them, you don't keep track of them, right? You don't measure them, you don't go there for some reason or another. Suddenly you find yourself three or four years later not having been to a county. So I was determined I was gonna go to every county every year. Saw new things, new ag enterprises, new farms, new, um, new operations, different types of agriculture. You know, we raise a lot of corn and soybeans and hogs and cattle in the state. A lot of eggs, turkeys, a lot of other things. We have specialty crop producers, we have folks that make great tires and bins and, and farm equipment and, and process. And, and so I got a chance to be able to see that. And, and when Secretary Ag of Agriculture called up and said, can I, can I stop by? Most people said yes. <laughs> and so that was just a, a wonderful activity to be a part of. 
Now, speaking of the Secretary of Agriculture, what was it like after you got your head around, you've had three terms as Secretary of Agriculture uh, in your home state, and you've been to 99 counties, 10 years, 12 years in a row now, you've really got a good feel for it, and you get picked to go, you get nominated by President Trump to go to Washington to serve in a role, a capacity that was newly minted, food production and conservation. That's a new undersecretary's mission. And so you were not given a playbook, you were given blank pages, though obviously there were a lot of existing programs, the three that you're in charge of, Farm Service Agency, NRCS, and Risk Management. You know, looking at those, what was it like to, I'm not gonna say start new, but to begin a different graduate degree program? Well, for me, a lot of it was Secretary Purdue. Um, I did not know Secretary Purdue before we had our first conversation. We sat down and had a conversation, and I could see why everybody liked this guy, um, why he was a popular governor in Georgia, and he talked about making government work better, and then his vision was to pull these three agencies together, a different combination than had been together before. Most of us would think, you look at a service center office in a county where FSA and NRCS are in the same service center, you think they're in the same mission area and same undersecretary, and they weren't. They had different ones. And so they developed rules different, you know, IT systems different, all kinds of things. Uh, the secretary had the vision to put them together, and as we talked, um, I just really liked his vision. I, I, I could imagine myself working for him if he was interested in me. Um, and, and I don't know, maybe it was a weak moment for him, but he was evidently interested in me. Um, and to be able to go in there and put these three agencies together, we build a business center, which is all the administrative function, those three agencies. We pulled them out of the agencies so they could focus on their mission. And a business center is 1,500 people. That, the mission area is about 22,000 people. Um, and just all kinds of things that matter to farmers. And it was a farmer facing part of uh, USDA. And that was the vision for the secretary. And when he talked about USDA, he said, we're gonna be the most efficient, the most effective, and the most customer focused part of the federal government. And I could see Farm Production and Conservation, FPAC, as the wheelhouse of that. I mean, that was really what he was thinking about was service. And there are a lot of other parts of USGA that were focused on it as well. But to farmers, they would think about us. They would think about their FSA program or the farm programs work, conservation programs. How can the crop insurance programs be better? Um, and so it was just a, a great fit, a great experience. Uh, we got great staff, yeah, please career staff. Tell me a little bit about, uh, tell the attendees at the Expo the caliber of individuals they have working for them at USD. So just really great career staff, most of which came from a field. They, they, uh, you know, they started on a farm someplace um, or they were the younger brother of somebody who's farming and, uh, and, and then were involved in a local field office, engaged with farmers firsthand, and rose through the ranks um, to become respected and, and promoted and now leading these agencies. And uh, not all of them were, but most of them were. If they got there, they were farmer friendly. They certainly understood their area. Uh, extremely great uh, expertise. And then we have a handful of political folks that come in as well. So. Um, my chief of staff was a former director of ag from Michigan, Jamie Clover Adams, uh, just absolutely top notch. Gets more done than any three people I know, three people combined that I know. Um, and, and, and we needed all that uh, during the, uh, the last crazy three years that we've been together. My, my administrators of those three agencies were all farmers, brought them in from the farm um, and uh, um, and so they had that farmer point of view. They also had credibility with the ag community, a great balance with the folks in the agencies have a great technical point of view. How do you carry out a farm bill? How do you make an equip program work in Maine and Arizona? 
you know, uh, because your needs in conservation are very different. And yet the program has to have some similarities. That's why it's funded the way that it is and structured the way that it is. And they could figure out how to do that. The same token, you allow kind of a balance of local leadership um, that helps you figure out, you know, it's, it's water efficiency in Arizona, it's wildlife or, you know, um, the seashore issues in, in Maine. And how do you balance all those pieces? And they were great at being able to do that. Just a really talented team, and, and we put them through a lot of pressure in the last three years. Then comes 2020, probably the most challenging year in recent memory, if not decades or a century. You're looking at obviously the pandemic, but people aren't really keeping an eye on the fact that there were 30 named storms that battered our shores. We had wildfires rampant throughout the West and the Pacific Northwest. Um, We had persistent drought. in many parts of the country after a few years of actually some better rainfall. And right here in Iowa in the Midwest, we had the derecho windstorm. I mean, so there was just one calamity after another. And this is where your team that you put together, you've been working on for three years. Tell me how they did, tell me how they braced for impact and responded. And our effort to try and serve them had to be impacted by COVID as well, we couldn't have our offices open. I remember a conversation in March. Um, as everyone was figuring out, you know, we had to create some distance between our people and other folks that are working as well as, as, well as the, the folks that are coming in the office and uh, thinking, there is no way we can do the kinds of things we need to do not in the office because our work gets done at a counter somewhere. FSA counter, an RCS counter, um, and uh, and yet our folks figured out how we could do that. We borrowed big <laughs> laptops to be able to send our folks home. We made sure phones rolled over. We created a national phone line that could roll back into people's houses so that they could answer the phone about programs. Um, In the midst of that, we had to stand up other programs too, both some disaster response kinds of activities, but certainly uh, the Coronavirus Food Assistance Program, CFAP 1 and CFAP 2, um, had to do that before we knew what the impact of coronavirus was really gonna be. And so to be able to figure that out, understand that, um, and put a structure together um, really looking at a computer screen as we were following each other on, you know, and all the meetings uh, for that corona, coronavirus food assistance program, the CFAP, original CFAP was, was all done out of, at least for me, out of a tiny apartment in Washington, D.C., and everybody else was online. Um, yeah, everybody hunkered down in their foxholes, their digital right. foxholes. Um, but I, I think, you know, one of the reasons it worked is because the crew knew the farmers were going through a terribly disruptive place. We had livestock producers that couldn't get their animals harvested. Um, we had crop producers that, that had no idea what prices were gonna do. And we'd lost our opportunity to be able to see all the benefits of, of the negotiations with China and the opportunity for trade there. We had dairy producers, I remember in April, projection was, $10 milk for the rest of the year. I mean, that was gonna put people out of business. We saw Springer prices drop maybe in half in some cases almost as people didn't want to go ahead and expand their operations and somebody else needed to close an operation. Um, and part of that reason for getting that first CFAP out was to recognize we need to let folks know and it's gonna be imperfect. We need to re- folks to recognize the government has some support here. Um, We're gonna get it out while it still matters. Um, There is a after um, from this event. Uh, Let's get there. Um, Let's make sure you can get there. Um, And and then we're gonna figure out how to do CFAP 2 better (laughs) because we could figure out there were holes in CFAP 1. Um, And we could 
we could do the numbers a little bit better. We had a little more time to be able to look at what the impact was. And to put together a CFAP2 that that sign up opened up um, late summer um, and went through uh, December. Um, and between the combination of those two, it was $23 billion worth of support uh, for farmers. Much needed support. Much needed support. And that CFAP2 was probably the broadest program we've ever had at USGA. It really touched nearly every producer. Um, other than folks that were producing non-alfalfa hay and were for their grazing land, if it impacted the animals, but not the grazing land itself, not pasture land, it impacted nearly every producer out there. So uh, um, the first CFAP, we had 660,000 folks that signed up for support there. Uh, the second one was uh, almost 200,000 more producers, which again is a bigger number than we've ever had and really was important to folks. Important financially, absolutely. Important psychologically as well. And at the end of the day, we end up with 2020 overall agricultural income being a better year in part because we saw some price rises at the end. We finally saw the benefits of, of the Chinese trade deal and need in, in, in some of those challenges you talked about in production impacted the supply that we had. Uh, so we saw some better prices uh, that came in at the end of 2020 as well on top of some financial support. So look into your crystal ball. You know Tom Vilsack, you know what he's capable of you have a good idea of what he's going to be facing, challenges that you just discussed as far as production, as far as conservation. But also, he's on the other side of the aisle. And so that's going to provide other challenges, a different way to run USDA. Tell me what you see going for, for him during a Biden administration. I think we're fortunate to have uh, Tom Vilsack as, as uh, uh, President Biden's uh, Secretary of Agriculture. Um, Again, he, he understands USDA. He has a different style than Secretary Purdue has. Um, and, and he has different responsibilities here. The president's expecting different things from him than, than President Trump was expecting uh, from Secretary Purdue. I think one absolute parallel is it sounds like both of them really have the ear of their president. Um, and uh, I remember Secretary Purdue saying as he left the White House, nearly every time the president would tell him, Stop him, say, Sonny, are you taking care of my farmers? Um, and that sense, and, and there were several times that certainly the secretary had to challenge the president on different pieces that he was doing. And I tell you, that relationship, it sounds like, with, uh, with President Biden, President-elect Biden, and, and Secretary Vilsack is, is equally strong. Uh, they absolutely understand each other, appreciate each other, and that's a good thing for agriculture. Great. Now, I do think he has some extra challenges besides making sure that we gotta have a food supply that works and, and hopefully we don't have a tail end of coronavirus or other black swan like that that comes in um, and certainly conservation programs that work. Um, he, he is charged with finding a way to address climate change through agriculture, um, kind of an additional responsibility on the conservation side. It's not just holding soil in place, not just water quality. It's also understanding carbon and the opportunity to store it, um, trying to figure out what that creates. Is it a government system that helps? Is it a private support system where companies are paying for carbon credits or other things? And does the government just figure out how to count them? Um, or what that all looks like. Um, but, but he's going to have a good team around him. A lot of folks that have thought about this as well. Um, Ag's, you know, always interested in change and interested in new things, but always hesitant about us understanding all the unintended consequences of every change. Uh, trying to make sure that, you know, at the end of the day, we still got to produce food. And, and we need to do that in a way that the American public expects that's efficient, um, that's on time, that's a lot of choice. Um, and we could do that through a pandemic. Um, so a system's gotta be resilient in addition to efficient. Um, and now we have to do it trying to understand how carbon and, and that whole model fits into this as well. 
talking about black swan events, you're sitting there early 2020 and you're thinking to yourself, is this really happening? Is this really going to be? What was your thought process as far as how bad can this get? How much do we have to do? What's coming next? It's almost like you just throw out the playbook. What do you do for all those months? And, and how did you and the other undersecretaries support Secretary Purdue? Well, I think um, none of us knew what was going to happen. Uh, I think there was no reason not to think it was going to be, you know, two months of terrible times and then we're going to be all over it. <laughs> um, and obviously it was a lot longer, a lot longer than that. Um, and there was no playbook. And so there was no understanding that, you know, one of the first hits would be animals that were ready for market, not having a place to go and get harvested, being worried about folks in processing plants that were logically close by each other so that processing plant could operate. Um, but that was exactly the wrong place for them to be during a pandemic that could get spread from person to person. Um, or that the whole system had to change from restaurants where half the meals were eaten to almost everything going through retail space um, and, and what that meant to packaging, what that meant to the demand. We demanded different kinds of things off, an, you know, off, off a beef uh, carcass uh, because we were eating at home versus eating in restaurants. Um, and so it changed values out there as well. So um, I think, uh, you know, first of all, you, you address the the concern that was in front of you. It was processing plants and understanding how we do that and what we needed to be able to support if we needed to put down animals or other kinds of things. How to make sure that packages could be relabeled that were going into, into institutions. And that's just not a USDA element. It isn't. That's it is FDA. FDA in that case. And so certainly that was a part of it, was working with our folks in other federal agencies. There's a big concern around labor. What was going to happen to farm labor? I mean, for a while, there was a discussion, we're going to shut down our embassies overseas because we need to be able to do that to keep everybody safe. But wait a minute, we have foreign workers. They need to come in here and harvest these fruits and vegetables that people are expecting to buy in the grocery stores and that farmers have ready to go because the sun, sun still shines. <laughs> Hopefully, the rain still comes. Um, and we need to be able to find some help to be able to make that happen. And so in that case, Secretary reached out to Labor and to State um, to be able to talk to them. How do we make sure that we keep the folks that are here, we don't force them to go home, if folks have already been through the process before, can we streamline that process? We're probably going to have struggle to get in brand new folks that need to go through an interview, but we can address that Labor situation uh, in a way that will get us most of what we need. And, and I heard very few folks that said it was, that, that it was a lot worse this year or that it was as bad as they thought it could be. So um, they're just, you know, cascading event to event, uh, activity to activity, farmers to families food boxes. These were boxes that were put together in part because we heard some food was going unused. Uh, we had fruits and vegetables that they couldn't find a, a market. We had farmers, or we had families that were absolutely overwhelming our food, our food banks, and that whole system was, was absolutely um, full to capacity. So how do we create another way of getting that food to people? Let's, let's find some of the folks, the farmers that can't sell stuff. Um, let's find some of those food service um, folks that were moving the logistics of food around that could help us package that, and then let's find others out there, churches and, and, and community organizations that could deliver these boxes uh, to folks that needed them. I, I got to a couple of those food box events where you're delivering them, and uh, I, don't, I don't think I, I probably got to half a dozen or a dozen of them, and I, I never went to one that there weren't tears from either the folks getting some of that food, or sometimes it was the folks with the logistics that were running the trucks that used to deliver to schools or restaurants, and now they were delivering to this, and they said thank you for, first of all, us being able to hire some of our folks back, keep them employed, but now we get to see where that food goes, 
and how much it matters. You gave us an opportunity to matter in this time. Um, and, and, and there was a lot of special, wonderful activities that happened as people responded to the needs. You had an opportunity to go to about a dozen different distributions when the farmers to family food boxes were shared with people who had real needs in a, in a manner that helped producers who had produce that wasn't going to market. It was a win-win opportunity for everyone. Tell us about that program. Hey, it was really a special kind of activity. I, the USDA folks that put that together it wasn't our mission area. It was marketing regulatory programs as well as food and nutrition folks. But that crew put that together in a matter of a few weeks um, and uh, could put this out to bid to see who would participate. Uh, the folks that were kind of the connector piece were the folks that used to deliver to restaurants and schools. Now they were buying uh, from farmers. Um, I talked to farmers themselves who said, I would have lost my business without this because I lost who I was selling to and now this took my product. And they said, this is top notch. This is, this is not our tail end stuff. This is, this is our top end stuff. Um, and then I talked to some of those distributors as well who said, um, you know, we're, we have all these wonderful trucks, we have this great warehouse, we have the best employees, and now we have a way to use them in a way that matters. Um, and at those events, generally, we'd have some of each of those folks, as well as the community organizations that were there, uh, 4-H groups or Boy Scout troops or others that were at a church and were handing those boxes out. You'd come and there'd be you know, a quarter mile of cars lined up along the street because they all heard that at three o'clock this afternoon, the boxes are coming out and they'd drive through and they had this little string of cars through a parking lot and figure out how many boxes in a car. And, and um, it, also bought, it also bought cheese products and others really helped the dairy industry. Um, it just, it was a very emotional experience. Um, some of these folks that are in the logistics had a great business, felt very good about it, wanted to be able to continue after this, but said, we're helping families that would be hungry tonight um, with, without this uh, activity happening. So we're really glad to be able to have our folks here um, and be able to have our folks hired, but we're glad to be able to help, as well as those farmers who got to see something they normally don't see somebody who is at the receiving end, they usually send it off the farm in a truck. Um, and, and they may be nice people that are driving those trucks off the farms, but maybe not um, quite the emotional tug uh, that these families were in these cars uh, to be able to pick up these boxes and, and say how important it was to their, to their family that night or that week to be able to have these boxes. That makes such a difference there, mm -hmm. it really does. Uh, it gets to that point that you and I talked about briefly earlier was the different distribution silos, the institutional versus the retail consumer. What a pivot that had to be for the industry to go from all of that institutional preparation, packaging and delivery and then try to shift that into, because there were, there were more than a few press stories about empty store shelves. Yeah. And as we both know, the empty store shelves were not indicative of the lack of produce or the lack of beef or pork. Mm -hmm. It was a matter of getting it to those stores and to those consumers. Tell, tell us about that pivot. You know, I, I would say a lot in agriculture is invisible to most consumers out there. There's no reason for it to be because I want to choose between, you know, a, a, a yellow grape and a purple grape and, and my kids like the yellow grapes or whatever. That's what we're thinking of. We're not thinking of how they got there. We're not thinking of the farmer. We're not thinking about the folks that shipped it. We're not thinking about the folks that boxed it up and got it to the right store and, and um, made sure that that shelf was not empty. And, and I think we all appreciate all pieces of that. Uh, certainly farmers appreciate those folks working in a harvesting plant right now <laughs> to a much greater degree. Uh, I think all of society appreciates farmers to a greater degree and everybody else. So as you say, I, I mean, a real challenge in figuring out how to pivot. So I think for a system that was built on efficiency, it was really about 
always finding a way to be most efficient. How can we be competitive, make sure that we can retain a little bit of this income and that we can do it in a way that's competitive against others so that the consumer can have the best priced food out there. System had to find its resiliency, it had to find a way to be flexible. And, and by its nature, this efficiency set up in just in time, everything's gonna get there the day or the day before it's needed and that's it. Um, had to find a way to double the amount of food going out of grocery stores um, and, and change the kinds of food that were there. Um, and, and it did. It, it, it did, and in some places we lost a little choice for a little bit of time, but we, we're almost no place was there not food available. Maybe it wasn't what we went in the store to buy. Maybe it wasn't my yellow grapes, <laughs> but it was yeah, certainly some purple grapes. ones for, for a that's, week that's or right. so. Yeah. Um, and so it just, it, it just was amazing what everybody did. Um, and I think it will, at, at least people appreciate agriculture more and maybe understand some of those steps a little bit more. We're going to soon forget about it, I'm sure. And, and that's a constructive thing that's good. That means it's working. Um, but we should never ever underestimate the kinds of things that people did to be able to continue to get food delivered. Um, and, and it took that whole chain working together. Certainly government had a role in that. We had to figure out how to relabel and figure out how to be able to provide waivers, make sure that everybody knew that agriculture was essential and these folks needed to be on the road and they needed to be delivering and, and um, we w did have food. Food production had not stopped. Um, it was going to be there, so, so you don't have to hoard. There is stuff that's coming, but we've got to be able to support that as well. And certainly that was a role of USGA, a small part, when, when the real magic was done by the businesses and the farmers and the folks in our real t retail outlets out there. Um, those who are real heroes in making this all happen will long be underestimated the role that they played in reducing the impact of the pandemic. You know, you hit on a point there that I'd like to stress. Uh, when, when we think about the United States of America, we think about a strong military. We think about our energy security and our ability to uh, power this country, whether it be at home or the engines of industry or commerce. Tell me what you've learned about food security in Washington, the overall big picture, and how it is such a singular benefit to America to be blessed with what we have in terms of resources, in terms of personnel. Here we are in the Stein Barn, obviously, in terms of research. What those distinctions matter to us? Yeah, I think. Uh, none of us appreciate what it goes what goes into all the other things. I, I, I don't appreciate what it takes to build a brand new pickup um, and all the things and the specialty that has has gone into that and the expertise that's gone into that. Certainly it would seem like food is pretty basic. Why would there be that much? Um, and, and I got a chance to get around the country. I visited uh, 48 states and farms in all those states and some of our employees in all those states as well. And I saw potato producers that could tell me everything about each variety of potatoes and how to set their machine and the, the specialized production that they knew and understood. And that repeated itself to orange producers and every other kinds of production. So it takes an expertise. I, I always say I'm a corn and soybean guy. I can figure out how to drive a tractor, but I would. I would crash and burn if he stick me on an orange farm and tell me to make a living there. I wouldn't be able to do it. I wouldn't understand how to manage citrus greening and when to harvest and when to spray and how to fertilize a crop and, and how old, too old for a tree or those kinds of things. It, it's so impressive, uh, the kinds of things that people are doing. And I'm just talking about the farmers. <laughs> than everybody else, from the marketing system that allows you to be able to sort and figure out what markets need what product. You know, you think of a, a pork carcass, and, and some of that Americans don't really like that much, and so we ship it overseas and we find the right customer. We find the right customer here domestically for each part of that. If, if all of us had to eat every part of a pig, <laughs> some of us would stop before we finished that. Uh, and yet we found a way to create value 
in this amazing food system that's out there. Um, and it is built on the people that are part of agriculture, the broad agriculture, certainly the farmers, uh, but much broader than that too. It's, it's uh, amazing and I would say we saw the best of it in 2020, the absolute best as people had to just pivot so fast to be able to continue to stay in business, continue to make value out of things they produced and, and certainly find a way to be able to find the consumer in a brand new place, in many cases than where they used to be. Thank you for joining us here at the Stein Barn for your 13th or 14th Land Investment Expo. We really appreciate your time this morning. Appreciate it, thank you, Eric. Thanks for joining me on that exclusive interview with Bill Northey, the Undersecretary for Farm Production and Conservation at the United States Department of Agriculture. Another Land Investment Expo exclusive.